The Passion of Jesus I Was Thinking of You Written by Miss Lorianne Matisse Read for you by Chiquito Jochen Crasto Scene 17 Setting Back at the Praetorium Matthew Chapter 27 With the manipulation of the priests, the rant of the assembly, the desire of Pilate to uphold his reputation before his people, and the troop of Roman soldiers willing and obedient to carry out their orders, the stage for my ultimate spectacle was completed. The demented crowd syndrome, mixed with fear, peer pressure, egos, and brute strength, had kicked into full gear. I had just endured the most brutal of tortures, and I was the one who felt sorry for them. I knew what I had to do, but they did not know. Later, at the point of my death, when I will cry out to my father, many of them will bow on bended knee and know that they have killed a righteous man. But today, I was to be slaughtered, not worshipped. It was necessary to bear curse of humanity upon myself so that I could absolve your curse. When you have been mocked, beaten, or scourged, physically, mentally, or emotionally, I have experienced suffering before you. I am alone in my suffering. But you will never be alone. I will have gone before you to prepare eternal paradise when there will be no more pain. I will never leave you, nor forsake you, for after all, I was thinking of you, as I am thinking of you now. When you are weary, I will cause you to rest in green pastures, I will lead you beside still waters, I will restore your soul, I will lead you in my path for righteousness' sake. In your deepest valley, I am with you, even in the shadow of death. You will fear no evil. My rod and my staff will comfort you. In the presence of your enemies, I will prepare a table for you. I will anoint your head with oil. Your cup will graciously run over. Goodness and mercy will follow you, and you will dwell in my house forever. Psalm 23 when you find yourself surrounded by a crowd demanding your crucifixion after they have already beaten you, come away with me. This crowd could be co-workers who ridicule you or members of your own family or your government or even your religion who persecute you. Come away. You can't find a quiet place of rest in me. Come away, my beloved. Come away from the noise, the confusion. Come rest by my still waters. Come lie down in my green pastures. I am thinking of you. I feel your need for sleep, lasting rest and peace, just as I could feel the needs of each hard heart surrounding me now, even while they shouted out obscenities and hurled insults at me. One of the soldiers who looked like a captain was twisting large thorns into the shape of a crown. I could see the malice in his heart as he went to great lengths in order to make fun of me. The mangling of the thorns in his huge gnarly hands reflected his twisted heart, savage and cruel. He perhaps had no idea of what drove him to be so intent on crafting this odious crown of corruption. When he was a boy, he wanted to be a sculptor. But after years of hardship growing up with a harsh father and serving in the heartless Roman army, he had long since forgotten this dream. I knew the motivating force behind his actions. Hurting people hurt people. He was tired of the abuse of his ruthless leaders. He had become the strongest and toughest of the soldiers in order to protect himself. But his heart was bitter. He could protect his body with physical strength, but he could not protect his heart. A bitter root had developed in his heart, 
and tree of the rotten fruit of malice had formed inside of him to defile those around him. Years ago, after each sun had set, he went to bed fuming with hurt and anger after his father's severe beatings. The festering of his wounds gave the real enemy of his soul a foothold for this bitter root to grow. This anger only grew more intense when he joined the Roman army. His temper made him a quick fighter, and he became one of the most revered soldiers. The rage inside of him welled up like a smoldering volcano. As he formed the warped crown, the heat inside of him grew more intense, and the explosion was soon to be released with full vengeance on my head. Here I was, weak and helpless, just as he once was. He had vowed as a boy to never be weak again, and he hated the sight of the pathetic man cowering before him who called himself the Son of God. Do not let the sun go down while you are angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 to 27. I knew the one, the evil one, who was really the one mocking me behind this soldier's stiff, unshaven jaw, the one driving the force of his fury. Continually, over time, Satan will try to convince people that he has the power, but he has no power. All power has been given to me, in heaven and on earth. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 In a few hours, I will make an open display of victory over the enemy. The seed which came through Eve continued on through the scarlet thread of redemption to my virgin mother Mary, will crush the lying serpent's head forever. I will be obedient unto death. My death will be the victory. Surely, my death is a more powerful expression of my love than my resurrection. I am God. It is easy for me to live. I am life. I came to give life and more abundantly, but to die for the sins of humanity. This is my greatest act of perfect love. Forgiveness is the pivotal point of my message. Many false gods will vie for your love and devotion, but only one god will die for you. One day, when you know you need a savior, I will be there. Pilate hoped that the scourging would be enough to satisfy the crowd, the scribes, and the Pharisees. But as the bloodthirsty crowd saw the blood running down my ripped face, my torn chest and back, they only seemed to want more. Crucify him! Crucify him! My sacrifice would not be complete without my death. Just like the blood of each slaughtered lamb applied to the doorposts in Egypt saved the firstborn of every family from the angel of death. Now, my blood can be spread over anyone's heart, anyone who calls on my name. I came to my own, and those who were my own did not receive me. But as many as received me, to them I gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in my name. John chapter 1, verses 11 to 12. The soldiers barbarically tossed the scarlet robe over my torn shoulders in order to mock my royalty. They pressed the cloth into my wounds to cause extra anguish, embedding the robe into my sores. As they clothed me, they may have felt the power of my mantle of authority which reigns over all of the earth. The same power which could blast the clothes right off of them, the power that could strip their human hearts, leaving them as naked as I was. But it was not the time for this power. My people needed a humble saviour who could be humiliated for them so that when they realise their own humiliation, when they are stripped bare, with nothing to cover their sin, they have me, a Saviour, who has borne their humiliation. Most of the soldiers were young men, strong, trained warriors. 
yet so scarred underneath, so frightened. Often the toughest men are the most timid inside. Their strength becomes their weakness, because they can hide momentarily behind a strong physique. Those who are physically weak live with a daily realization that it is God who must help them be strong. In their weakness, my strength is made perfect. Today, it is important that the soldiers do not recognize me. If they did, they might take compassion on me. They might even try to save me, release me from my bonds, and find a way to get me out of here. But no one must save me today. It is I who will save the world. As it is written, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 At this time, the grotesque crown of thorns came into full view. The pain up to this point had been excruciating beyond belief. I did not know how I could bear any more. Anyone who had known me before would not recognize me now. The soldier grinned maliciously as he carried the tangled mess of thorns with its long spikes and lifted it high above his head, showing his wicked craftsmanship to the horde. He callously brought it over to me and held it above my head, much with the look of a joker on his face. The crowd rose to their feet and clapped even louder as he placed it as a crown on my head. The soldiers rallied to help him slam the malicious crown into my skull. The blood streamed down my face, into my eyes. I could barely see. My blood-soaked robe was hot and heavy. I staggered as my body shook uncontrollably from the pain. The soldiers mocked me and ridiculed me, as they pried my fingers open to shove the fake staff into my right hand, Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews! With a crown of thorns, the scarlet robe and the staff, I looked much like a sad clown in a circus. What was so ironic, yet so fatally true, was that before them did stand a king, the king of the universe. The world rarely recognize greatness in a person until after they die. This is how it will be in my case. This is how it will be with countless men and women who will come after me in my name. The world did not recognize me. The world will not recognize my disciples. Many true saints will give themselves for me. These are the flaming pillars who make up the structure of my true church. These will suffer martyrdom, even by the hands of the organized church. From this day on, there is only one temple, me. To those who are perishing, my way seems foolish. But to those who are saved, my way is powerful. The foolish now were before me, around me, behind me, spitting on me cursing me from outside the gate. Some of the soldiers knelt before me to exemplify their mocking even further, while they continued to shout, Hail, King of the Jews! The one who had made the crown of thorns now stood back, with his arms crossed to view his work with deplorable pleasure. A brief memory surfaced as he looked on his heinous work of art now driven into my bleeding skull. He remembered playing with a branch when he was a boy, twisting it together with other branches to make his first work of art, a nest for a baby bird who had fallen from a tree. Why am I thinking of this now, he thought to himself, as the crowd and the praetorium faded into the backdrop. He remembered how he felt as he gently laid the baby bird in the nest and settled it back in the olive tree. There were bluebird eggs on the ground, too. He lifted the fragile shells, and with childlike hope placed them back in their nest. The broken shell of the baby bird lay on the ground, 
He affectionately put it into his pocket and waited behind a bush, watching until the mother bird found her baby and the eggs in her newly placed nest. He had felt so proud. The memory jogged something within him so tender, so true. This was before he became bitter and angry. It was at this moment, when his tough shell of the beast he had become, began to crack like the shell of that tender egg. What's happening to me? Why is everyone staring at me? he thought. He gazed all around, but no one was paying any attention to him. What's wrong with me? I must be going mad. He then looked up at me. I lifted my eyes, with blood pouring over them, to meet his gaze. He had felt proud a moment ago when the, the crowd cheering him on, but all of a sudden he did not feel as proud of his work any more. Why is he looking at me like that? His thoughts stammered to himself. Perhaps I looked much like the baby bird, but instead of saving it, he was hurting it. Tears welled up in his eyes. He blinked many times to keep them from falling down his face, thus being shamed him in public. He cast his eyes to the ground and did not look up any more. I was not thinking of the pain that was set before me any longer. I was thinking of him. He would lift his eyes to me again one day in prayer. At that moment, forgiveness will flow to him from the blood pouring down my face. His salvation would be sealed because I could see inside to his heart of repentance. I lifted my eyes to heaven. I was not thinking of him any more. I was thinking of you, just as I am thinking of you now when you have twisted a lie that caused hurt, instead of making a beautiful nest of truth to heal. All throughout the coming years on earth, even after my death and resurrection, people, much like those present today, will continue to mock me. I do not look like a king. I will not look like a king reigning from my cross, bloody and beaten beyond human repair. But what does a true king look like? Does he look like Caesar? A true king is a servant of all. During my greatest humiliation, I was thinking of you, just as I am thinking of you now. When you are ruled by a wicked ruler, and the people in your nation are oppressed, you have a righteous ruler you can call upon. Messiah Jesus, the Savior of the world, I am with you in your season of humiliation or torture, when no one recognizes you and me in you, when they hate you, cast you out of their churches and synagogues, disown you, beat you, dismember you, or even kill you. Their faulty institutions are threatened when you simply point out the one narrow way which leads to eternal life. Jesus. Some people will label me a higher power, a prophet, a guru, or a good man. All of these are partially true, but not the truth. If you strip me of my power of being God on earth, then when you are desperately lost and you need power, you will not have that power. Power is not found in a mere man, but in the name of your Lord the name above every name, Jesus the Messiah. I am he, I could have said, and watched the soldiers fall to the ground. But instead they puffed their chests out, grabbed the staff they had given me and beat me over the head. The staff only served to pound the thorns deeper into my skull. It was almost impossible to think now but with every bit of strength I had in me, I was thinking of you. I was thinking of times of persecution that you will endure, when you will be in your own torture chamber, where your physical or emotional pain will seem to be beyond what you can bear. 
when you are tempted to deny me, when you wonder if it is all true, when the words of the liar will beat against your skull. See, you trusted in Jesus, and look how much you have suffered. When you have claimed to be a prophet, and now you are being burned at the stake, it is at this time I am thinking of you. Don't shrink back. Be faithful unto death. And they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 I could not see any more, because of the blood running into my eyes, but I must remain focused on the joy that is set before me, the joy I cannot see with my human eyes. I will not look on what I see, but what I do not see. Set my sight on the finish line, heaven. There can be no flinching, no second-guessing, no show of weakness, no sign of breaking. I must go through with his plan. I have put my hand to the plough for my kingdom, and I will not look back. So when you have put your hand to the plough to sow into the kingdom of God, you will have a Saviour who has gone before you without retreating in the face of pain. You will find strength in my sacrifice to not look back. I will steady myself with roots, unshakable roots, which grow from the beginning, wrap the globe, and hold the universe unto the end of eternity. With these strong roots, I will find the courage and tenacity to remain faithful to the end. I am the author and finisher of your faith. I was thinking of you as I am thinking of you now. When I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Eve's Memoirs and Other Books and Art by Laurie Matisse Available at www.evesmemoirs.com www.lauriematisse.com www.mysticcenter.com Laurie's blog, Weaving Light lauriematisseblog.wordpress.com For information on Eve the Musical, contact lauriematisse at gmail.com End Times Info www.mysticcenter.com www.calculatingthelast7.com Support the work of translating this book into other languages. HTTPS colon two forward slashes www.patreon.com forward slash Laurie Matisse